As usual, I'm going to to talk about some some topic today. It's a related topic about uh, one of the first topic we'll be speaking of in endoscopic ear surgery is how to get it started uh, and with endoscopic ear surgery. Actually, uh, this is a common topic, common presentation in every curse. Uh, you will you you will go or you will be if some 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 endoscopic ear surgery courses. You know that this is a common, very common topic. But I will do I will try to do a, a different a different approach to to get how to I well you will see in a lot of presentations of what an endoscope is how to how to start with how to hold the endoscope what instruments do you have to do I will try to skip that as fast as we can so I will be able to uh, tell you to explain how was my 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 insertion into endoscopic care surgery and how to gain the surgical abilities or the the manual abilities as as fast as you can because that's why people go to courses mostly dissection courses to gain the abilities to be able to perform surgeries uh, in in, in day, a day by day basis so I will try to speak uh, for my point of view, what worked for me and how was my experience starting with the endoscopic ear surgery. So important things, here is one of the most iconic uh, drawings you will see. Uh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna enter in the debate of, of endoscopic or microscopic surgery, it's not what I'm, what I'm here for today, but uh, to understand that when you op when you operate with a microscope, you have all your real canal free for uh, maneuver with your instrument. With the endoscopic surgery, it's different. You will have your endoscope in one hand that will mostly use a lot of the space in your your stinger auditory canal, and you will have the uh, if you're a right-handed surgeon, you will have the instrument on the other side. So it depends on which ear are you operating in. Mostly, in if you, for example, are operating in the right ear and you're working on your attic, you will be crossing the instruments most of the time. A uh, different thing is if you're going to operate on the left side and you're going to operate on the attic, you will be mostly free for not crossing your instruments. It will be more comfortable. So it's important to know that um, side matters in this, in this, in this, when you're starting. When, uh, when you have more, a little bit more experience, you will know that uh, you will auto automatically will will change your your configuration inside your brain so you will work comfortable anyway so but for starters uh, i recommend for you to start try to start with left ears because are if you're a right uh, right side surgeon it's easier for starting left side left side ears so endoscopes uh i started my practice we didn't have a special instrumentation for for endoscopic ear surgery so we started with regular autology, autology surgical tools that we still use, normally the same. And uh, with the endoscopes, uh, we started with the sinus surgery uh, endoscopes. I still use them um, regularly, uh, for mostly for cholestatoma surgeries, so you have a wider, a wider screen with a, with the, with a bigger scope. Uh, you have a, a, wider, a wider screen, so you will see better the, 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 the corners of the, of the screen. And actually, doesn't give you a lot of, of advantage, the three millimeters over the four millimeters, you have a little bit more space sometimes with the tympanic frame. If you want to enter the tympanic frame, the four millimeters may be sometimes a little bit bigger, but, and you will be able to enter with the three millimeters, but mostly what I want to say is that you don't need special uh, instruments for starting your endoscopic ear surgery practice. Uh, we started with the uh, sinus surgery regular endoscopes and I still use um, normally I still use the regular autology surgical tools. We don't have any 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 special instruments. We don't have the the sector suction. Uh, we use just what we had and nowadays sometimes we have in our in our in our repertoire the, the three millimeter scopes but, uh, still, sometimes I use three millimeters. Sometimes I use forty millimeters indistinctly. You can perform every surgery with the regular sinus scopes. So that said, uh, the first important tip, and the mo for me, I believe it is, is the most important tip for starting your practice and for getting your abilities, is not starting surgery. Okay, surgery is surgery. So you will have to gain your abilities elsewhere. So first. Uh, mostly 
every resident, every young, young ENT surgeon right now, you have some experience operating on sinus surgery, endoscopic septoplasties. So don't be afraid. You already have the abilities. You have the endoscope. Uh, you can handle an endoscope correctly. You can operate an with an endoscope correctly. You will feel comfortable with the endoscope. So don't, don't, don't get anxious. It's just a different anatomy. But still, it's a small, smaller cavity. Uh, sometimes uh, the patients you it will have you will have problems if you wound the external jolly canal for bleeding purposes. And what I recommend, and I always recommend, is to use your endoscopes in your outpatient clinic every day. Remove ear wax with your endoscope. Uh, suction the, some debris, some otorrhea with your with your with your with your with your suction instrument inside your outpatient clinic in and practice every day, every day. I use the endoscope every day for everything in the ear, for removing ear wax, to removing gel foams, for looking, just for looking. If you don't have to instrument anything inside the ear canal, just get used to using your endoscope in your ear. You will. If you're able to handle the endoscope and not and removing an ear wax without uh, without hurting the patient it means that you handle correct you you're able to handle correctly without touching without wounding the, the external auditory canal that's important for surgery so first bullet point to is to to improve your practice is to use your endoscope in your daily practice so uh, said that uh, what's the important well this is one of the most iconic images it's a presentation from from Daniel Lee a couple of years ago and it's the same year uh, we see it with a look with a with an endoscope and with a microscope I don't have to explain anything you have to you can see the dif the difference this is a, a a long process an eroded long process of the incus and it's the image sometimes the image is just talk by themselves important what it's important to to say is that we change this for improved visualization it's mostly the, the the what's most important for endoscopic ear surgery and why we change it to endoscopes and then uh the learning curve the learning curve here it's a little bit of a a discussion topic actually it's very controversial but it's it, it's different it depends the learning curve it's very different if you are learning uh, endoscopic ear surgery from scratch or you're changing from the microscope actually if you're changing from the microscope to the endoscope the learning curve is quite slow and quite hard but if you're learning endoscopic ear surgery from scratch it's actually very easy why because you already normally you have the abilities of endoscopic surgery mostly uh, surgeons that comes just from the microscope they're not used very used to the endoscope otologist I mean and uh, second uh, the the uh, that's that's mainly the, the I believe it's mainly the the, the main thing but still uh, the learning from someone that already knows endoscopic ear surgery if you're learning from scratch it's very easy because you can be easily conducted in the in the screen everyone's seeing the same thing so you can you can be I can able I be I'm able to go there go there dissect that cut that uh, you know that's the facial nerve to go there that's 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 your uh, incredible joint that's that's the oval window so teaching it's not hard I had the 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 opportunity of teaching a lot and that's mm, probably when I learned the most but still teaching is not hard I believe that in one year one uh, young uh, ENT can become an endoscopic ear surgeon and to become to do any surgery in just one year practice so for me the learning curve the process of how how to 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 operate in this the order of procedures you must learn to know is uh, first inlay meringoplasty it means that you don't have to elevate the tympanometer flap then an underlaid tympanomyoplasty uh, just or type 1 tympanoplasty if you want to learn how to elevate the tympanomyoplasty flap and here is where the controversies are because for me when you're when you're learning from scratch 
the, the next step would be stapes surgery or circular merge formations. Uh, stapes, uh, stapes surgery and circular merge formations are surgeries that have normal anatomy, not inflamed mucosa, and that helps you for bleeding control. Bleeding control is not easy always, and I will give you some tips to, to avoid bleeding, but still, in stapes, there's not a bleeding surgery. It's quite uh, normal anatomy, not inflamed mucosa, so we should not be bleeding a lot. So that's why I recommend for stapes surgery, stapes surgery one of the first steps to overcome. But still, controversies are that people that are coming, that are actually good endoscopic ear surgeons, that are coming from the microscope, they say that stapes surgery is the hardest surgery to manage. I don't believe that's true. I believe that is depending on how you learn. And if you learn first with the microscope and then go with the endoscope, but I believe if you're learning from scratch, it's quite, it's one of the easiest surgeries of all. Then I would recommend to continue with type 214 tympanoplasties here is because normally you can have, you, you can have some dry ears and actually not bleeding a lot, but anatomy is changing. You can have some uh, tympanosclerotic plates. You can have some dehiscent facial nerves and stuff that can difficult your, your surgery. And after that, cholesteatoma surgery. And the last one, because again, with bleeding control problems, I would recommend you to, uh, to operate on superative super chronic otitis media, patients that have uh, active otorrhea. They are very inflammatory uh, patients with inflammatory mucosa. They tend to bleed a lot. So uh, I recommend to be the last uh, step. And the learning curve is always the same. Uh, you are like this uh, unconscient, um, unconscient, uh, uh, and you don't, and you don't, well, the same learning curve as, as always. You have this, this rapid phase of, of, of learning and then you manage a plateau and at first is very slow, uh, latent phase that's called and rapid rendering and then the plateau. Uh, then, uh, tips and pros. The first problem you will manage and you will encounter is the elevation of the tympanomial flap. My recommendation, don't use the cold instruments, just use the bogey. That's what it was meant for, not bleeding incision. So what I do, what we do first is just I I, I only uh, inject the stria vascularis, just, so just one injection with the pinephrine and, and a local anesthetic in the upper in the upper corner, and then I usually always elevate the tympanomial flap with the bobby. I use it at nowadays I use it at five uh, of potency, five watts, so you will not find a lot of 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 retraction of the flap. Actually, when you when, when you you reposition the flap, uh, you will find that the retraction is mostly that what you're seeing right now. So you can see here that with this only only point of injection and with the electrocautery, this is not an exception. Actually, this is how we how we raise it with uh, what you you have to manage and to understand that you you have to find just to get. Uh, faster surgeries and to not lose time in this step that it's actually the initial step is to uh, get some uh, bloodless feel and with the bobby it's actually quite easy to get that uh, this is an stapes uh, an stapidotomy an osclerotic, an osclerotic but actually if you want to do the uh, when when i when i when i work on 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 chronic ears, I uh, use the first uh, incision in the in the inferior tip and then one up at the at twelve. So I have you normally use a big uh, tympanomial flap. There's uh, some some paper with this. If you want to read it, and for res resuming being a summary of all of all this, uh, the bullet points I want to, to for you to learn is that. Uh, use the endoscope first, think first, uh, use the endoscope in your clinical practice, in your daily basis, and your office uh, with all the patients. Use the endoscope in your office practice. You will, you will be amazed how uh, you will be training your manual abilities. 
just and you will see it when you go back there to the OR you will see your abilities boosted um, again apply the correct learning order of procedures don't try to start with a cholestatoma surgery because you will be overwhelmed and you will be uh, you will be sad and you won't won't going to perform any surgeries anymore so start with the basics and uh, that was a really game changer game changer in my practice you use the bobby for elevating the tympanometer flap it will save you a lot of energy and time and there's no need for new equipment so uh, thank you for watching this was my practice for today tomorrow's lecture so thank you for watching all of you